Good morning. As Mati mentioned, I am going to uh, make a joint presentation with Adrian, where we will touch upon the situation of children under the age of five. In the first presentation, populations under a scenario with which we still have a pending debt. In this case, as a part of the project that I coordinate and we will work in Amazonas, Cajamarca, and Loreto. We collected information to determine, to determine health and nutrition conditions. Both provinces of the Amazon regions included the highest indicators that we're dealing with in these two days. The survey was made at the end of 2012 and allowed us to survey mothers of 1,372 children in both provinces. We collected data of child health, health determinants, behaviors and practices in families, as well as parasitic diseases. We will present a summary of the most important indicators and in which we consider should be included in the discussion that we are having today. If we look at the basic needs that have not been met, poverty measured through this index, we see that the indigenous population of these provinces are all poor. Almost 100% of the indigenous people in Bawa and Cordon Kangi are poor. And we look at extreme poverty. This difference is high and concentrated among the indigenous population. Looking at other indicators, for example, mother education, we see that mothers have very little access to education. Only 33% of indigenous women at Condor Kanki are illiterate, and when they go to school, they only attend for some years, which speaks about a limited access to educational services, but when we look in the field, this also implies a reluctance to factual, to cultural factors, which hinder the participation in the social aspect because they consider school a place to fall in love, which favors uh, pregnancy among adolescents. If we look at malnutrition, the difference between indigenous and non-indigenous children is evident. 56,2% of indigenous children in the provinces show malnutrition cases, which is threefold the situation of the non-indigenous kids. This difference can be seen in both provinces. In both cases, these figures are above the national average. If we look at chronic malnutrition in the different age groups, we see that there's a different kind of behavior. In the case of indigenous children, malnutrition shows this cumulative scheme which increases through years or through age group which is not the case of non-indigenous children, and we believe that there are elements that should be discussed which are probably related to structural factors that affect this population. In the case of anemia, we see that there is a similar behavior, more similar behavior. However, in every group, the average is above the national mean and 
if we look at the breakdown in the different groups, the different age groups show that children under 11 months have a high anemia prevalent, which is of concern. It is not only above the national average, but it's almost absolute. This reduces throughout time, and probably one of the factors besides those that we all know about is related to access to red meat, which what children are fed with up one day or two. And it's also related to the access of this kind of products in the market and the inclusion of this kind of food in their diet. Here we can see the results of parasitosis components. We see that 74% of children have parasites. Seven out of 10 has at least, have at least one parasite in their body and if we look at the system response with respect to institutional childbirth there is a strong difference between indigenous and non-indigenous population women go to their controls in the first quarter etc however when the labor time comes they prefer or they choose to give birth at home so only 13.8 percent of indigenous women go to a health facility for childbirth compared to non, the number of non-indigenous women with respect to cred controls, we see some indicators that continue to show this difference between indigenous and non-indigenous population. What calls our attention is that in both components of cred, the control of size and weight is carried out in an insufficient manner. However, this component has better coverage than the psychomotor control for the same age. So from 100% of charts, approximately 40% is not filled by the health care providers. And when, and when they have information, we have a prevalence of this kind of controls. So. This is important to bear in mind and to analyze to see what is going on with this component. We were talking about vaccination. In no case, we have reached an optimal vaccination level. for the basic schemes for the age of these children. And then we will move on to child development. What we proposed with Anna and the team was to try and focus on two topics which we all know about, which are the challenges as Lucia mentioned at the beginning of her presentation, that we're working on. However, we need to be aware because this is a pending issue. It is a high burden. It is something that will imply many challenges to the government, civil society, etc. So, Lucia, I am going to overrule what I said before. I will start with the past to con con finish in the future. Just to mention, this is the trend of child mortality under the age of five. This decline has been very marked, although this slight plateau at the end of neonatal birth 
So we must stress the importance of the work carried out in the past. However, we need to look specifically on how to recover this trend. Now, with respect to child chronic malnutrition, we've all met, we've all heard about it. There has been a lack of balance between the concern, the visibility, investment, etc., and consensus with respect to survival and growth, physical growth, size. And it has been assumed that if children survive and if they grow adequately, then the development comes on its own. But we clearly know, and we have discussed this in different form, that there is uh, enough awareness that this is not the case, and that although interventions are complementary, are differentiated, are specific for survival or to guarantee adequate development with respect to size and, of course, development. Some figures that work with child nutrition and food security that we work with some other agencies of the UN, we are processing the same pieces of information for their uh, research. The Bawang Kondor Kanki has the same data that we've been processing. And I'm going to show you three or four slides just to give a figure or to be able to quantify the dimension of this product. Just to point out So in this chart, we see that in these regions, this is the age at which children start acquiring the language skills, which is speaks three words. And we see this is the red line. This is the time in which, through expert consensus, 100% of children should have acquired this milestone. This is the initial one, three words. Only 74% of children reach this milestone at this age. If we look at age and development, then under the same logic recognizes five objects, which is one of the expectations. It should be around 40 months. 100% should meet this goal. Here we have a greater a delay. If we move forward, reproduces sentences, more complex functions, we see that only 25% is, so the impact of vulnerability situations accrues this disadvantage and makes children be worse off. So they are lagging behind in their growth development. According to the determinants, response to name, surname, and age, we see that in every case, the situation between 35 to 47 months, the percentage of children that acquire this habit is better in urban areas, better when it's healthy, when the mother is literate, when it has five or more home conditions, this is clear, and we've talked about this thoroughly with our colleagues from Mintis and Minty within the framework of Kunamas, supporting the skills of the family. One of the elements that is valued or appreciated are toys. Here we see that in those homes where there were toys or books, 76, 7% acquires this milestone, this skill, versus 40% when they don't have this toy. These are all poverty, vulnerable families, but which for one reason or another have given priority or have chosen to invest in some toy or book. So we all Make the same comment. It's not just a matter of giving out toys and books, but we need to understand why this poverty uh, situation family has given priority to this aspect. This is a way in which we can present the results. The average of milestones acquired between the age of 12 and 17 months, there is a progression. 
You know, if it first uh, crawls, then walks, he first sits, then he stands. The same happens with language. You can measure the number of milestones accrued. And here we see that when the child accrues a greater number of milestones, it is better when it's uh, normal nutrition, urban, and complete vaccination. This could be a proxy for access to services and a manner for care or the priority given by the families to raising their children. The same happens between 48 and 60 months with respect to language. It is the fact of having toys and books is very, very strong. The skills of the family, the role of the family with respect to the simulation process is instrumental. The same happens with respect to education of the mother, which is a very well-known variable. This was in the front pages of all newspapers and was broadcast by the radio show. This is not surprising. Obviously, beyond the criticism of the PISA methodology and the sort, there are also issues of the education sector with respect to coverage, quality, etc., etc. It is well known that the conditions in which the child reaches school are determinant. If they are anemic, if they are malnourished, if 25% reaches language skills, probably they will have hardship at learning age. They will have a clear disadvantage. And these children with greater disadvantages are when schools are worse off, when they're very poor, when they're, there is a very little possibility to reach the average or the highest income sectors. It is impossible. The first time I heard a presentation from my friend Mario Tavera, he presented a similar slide in the Congress. We've made a lot of progress. For every child that died, 70 survived. Before that, there were 40 or 25. So we've made progress with respect to survival. Doubtlessly, however, we need to double our efforts to continue improving child survival, obviously, recovering the decline trend, but making sure that these children that survive, that are it, it should move on from 70 to 100 or 120, reach the maximum potential development, the maximum development for them. Now, some recommendations. Well, first of all, rather than recommendations, we can mention the challenges that Lucia mentioned at the beginning. We know that they are in the agenda. We've been working with MINSA, we've been working with MIDIS. We know that this is a concern, a clear concern of the government, that, but we need to adapt to that concern. First, we should strengthen the intercultural approach in policies and programs. This is very clear. Yesterday, we talked about this. We have made progress. There are best practices. There is a greater concern with respect to interculturality in Andean areas. In the Amazonia, we are lagging behind and Possibly Mario can provide a great, better testimony of the situation. <laughs> this implies a great challenge because it's a different uh, vision of the world, different context, different geographical barriers, a different story altogether. Uh, it's not just translating to a different uh, Amazonian language the conditions. The barriers that Anita mentioned, why mothers have access to control without much differentiation between indigenous and non-indigenous, but once labor comes, the difference is enormous. 12% attempts uh, of health facility for labor. General population information about child development. This is critical. We have talked in length about this. Last week, we attended a meeting by meetings to look specifically at this topic to see how, in the results-based budget, we could include measurements of the work being carried out. I attended a meeting in Geneva some weeks ago on this topic. I would not dare to say that Latin America and Peru are leading this process. However, we are in the same level of confusion as everyone else, which is something. 
I think that this is a complex matter under debate globally, and Peru is making significant, significant efforts to take advantage and to continue in this line. And the last recommendation is to provide interventions to promote family strengthening and child development. There are, it is not as clear as child nutrition, it is not as clear as other things, but we need to explore this further, specifically with the colleagues from Minis and Minsa. We should try things out. There is no evidence on this regard. There are some references, some ideas, some clues. But when these programs are scaled up, then they start having complications that require adjustments. So we should start trying out different intervention modalities. And the last bullet is to have advocate, advocate for the inclusion of child develop, early child development for the post-2015 agenda. It is not in a renewed promise. It has a very strong component, which we will talk about Promesa Renovada. For Latin America, we must place ch early child development in the agenda. We should overcome child survival and place this topic in the agenda. And just some advertisement, there is an initiative of Great Challenge Canada, which if we manage to uh, reach 5,000 signatures to include early childhood development at the heart of a new post-2015 development framework, the UN Secretary General will work for this. Many of you received the link, the mails sent by Leticia almost every day. We have a link to this petition, so we would request you to personally and institutionally circulate this because it is necessary that in the future, the post-2015 agenda, this topic be considered a priority, at least for our region, because we think we deserve this. At least our children deserve it. Thank you.